The expression of love is an example of the changed heart at work. That's what... In Galatians chapter 5, this is going to be the last of our Galatians talk. And, uh, you know, when people start talking about being saved by faith and not by works, we've been talking about this for um, five weeks now. It's a scary topic that pastors typically don't talk about because when you say that you're saved by grace through faith and you're not saved by grace through the law, it tends to raise some questions as far as how do we live our lives and what do we do when we live our lives and are we just kind of on a free pass because we believe in God and that's all we really need to do is believe in God. Um, so we always hear this word called walking straight. Have you ever heard of this term? Walking straight, making your path straight. What does that even mean, right? So a sign that you're on the right path, what, what are the signs that you're on the right path, right? You, you maybe do good things or you feel right with yourself or you're serving at church or stuff like this, right? But we, we as humans always have this inability to not walk straight, don't we? We, ha we struggle with staying on that path, that, that, that straight path that um, we try to do on a daily basis. It's in our sinful nature. It is something that we as human beings, not as Christians, just as humans in general, struggle with, is trying to stay on the straight path. We relate living a righteous life with walking straight. But we'll never be able to do that, right? So why can't we do that? Why can't we walk on this straight path? And what does that mean about our faith? If we just continually mess up, if we continue to sin, if we feel like we're not walking in that straight path, what does that mean about our faith? It goes back to this question that I don't want to discuss this morning called, and it's the question of, is it once you're saved, you're always saved? Have you ever heard that one before? Once you're saved, you're always saved. I don't want to open up that can of worms today. I don't want to talk about that type of theology today. We could be here till we are blue in the face talking about that once saved, always saved thing. But this is the question that we're asking, right? What does it mean about our faith in God? So we talk about a lot. We've talked about a lot of the, about the law. And we talk about whatever you want to do. All you have to do is believe. You don't have to worry about any of the works, right? Is that the correct answer that we've been talking about for a month? Yes. All you have to do is believe to be saved. Is God going to forgive us for our sins after we believe? Yes. He's going to continue to do that. However, what happens to you on the inside and what we're going to see today is that when you are saved, your heart is changed and your whole life is transformed. Everything about the way that you are as a person completely changes on the inside and you become transformed. You want to live a different life, not because it will save you, but because you are no longer the same person that you were before you knew Christ. So when someone says that they're saved, but their life looks exactly the same as an unbeliever, as an unsaved person, it raises some concerns about whether this particular person actually knows Jesus. Those are the type of people that they give, and I don't know if this is the right way to say it, but I'm going to say it. It gives Christians a bad name because they're professing that they believe in Christ. However, they're walking the same way as unbelievers. You can't do both. That, that's like getting your cake and eating it too, right? You, you, it's not, you can't do that. You want to live this different life. So uh, just like the older brother, there, there's an interesting story uh, in Luke chapter 15 with the prodigal son. And we always hear the story of the prodigal son as the prodigal son, right? 
So the prodigal son is this boy. He wants his inheritance early. Dad says, great, you can have your inheritance, no problem. So he goes out, he spends it all. He gets stuck uh, feeding pigs. He's actually eating the food from the pigs because he has no more money to, to, to spend, right? He says, I don't want to live this life anymore, so I'm just going to try and go home and see what happens, right? So he goes home. Dad comes home. Uh, he comes home. Dad's meeting him at, at, the, at the end of the road, right? And they have this hog, and they say, we're going to have this party to celebrate the fact that you came back to the right path, right? You, you now know what it means, and we are just so happy that you came back. We don't care what happened in the past, but we just want you to come back, right? Well, we forget about the other brother. Do you remember the other brother? Now, there's another brother in this story. He did not go out and spoil his inheritance. In fact, he did exactly as his daddy told him to do. He did all the dishes. He washed all the clothes. He went and he cleaned his room daily. He went and mowed the lawn. You know, he did all of this stuff. But we always forget about this other brother. What happened when the prodigal son came home was the other brother got mad. And do you know what he said? How in the world are you going to throw a party for my other brother who is sinning all the time, yet here I am doing all the good things that I think I should be doing in order to keep my path straight and right? You see, the older brother, he was scared. He was scared that he might do something wrong. Now, there are two sides to this story, right? You go on the wrong path, or you try and keep your path straight. Are either one of them right or wrong? Those points are irrelevant. The point is that Jesus came to save us, and we must believe in that. But we want to change what's on the inside. So here, here's another great story. Um, there was a, a married woman who was in Atlanta with two small children. And uh, this story comes from Brennan, Ma Brennan Ma Manning in the book called The Rag Ragamuffin Gospel. And he said there's a married woman in Atlanta with two small children. And told me recently that she was certain that God was disappointed with her. Because she wasn't doing anything for the Lord. She wasn't helping out in any way for the Lord. So she told Brennan that she felt called to go into a soup kitchen ministry. But she struggled with leaving her children in someone else's care. She was shocked when Brennan told her that the call was not from God, but it was from her own legalism. Being a good mother wasn't good enough for her. Is being a mother serving the Lord? Somebody say yes. That's a big amen there. Serving kids, being a mom, is something that you could do to help serve and be a part of the Lord. You do not have to work at a soup kitchen. You do not have to do all the extra things. It is a big, big deal to just be a mom. And we celebrated moms um, a little while ago because of that fact it's a big big job so here's not what, what i'm not trying to say i'm not trying to get you give you a get out of jail free card serving is something that we should do out of the condition of our heart we should do it because we love the lord and so we're going to talk about this last we're going to talk about galatians chapter 5 now and we're going to look at this idea of how do we do this? How do we continue to believe in Christ, but yet serve? So we're going to start in chapter 5. We're going to be in verse 1. Paul writes, he says, It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. And do not lie, let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, he says in verse 2. I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. 
Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. Wait a minute. What are we talking about here? Verse 4. You are trying to be justified by the law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ, Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith, expressing itself through this wonderful four-letter word, love. We express our faith through love. How do you love? How do you love people? What are different ways that we could do that? We could serve people, right, through love. We can help people with love. We could be a part of our church with love, right? We can help our neighbor mow, go mow their lawn out of love or whatever. There are all tips, different types of way that we can love one another. And so this is how we express our faith. If you're not loving anybody, you can't have faith. Amen? If you're not serving in love for other people, you can't have faith. It's a both and, not an either or. So you have to do both. So toward the beginning of this chapter, he says, Paul says that for in Christ Jesus, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision counts for anything, but only faith working through love. Now, see, back then, circumcision and uncircumcision is a very well-known thing. Circumcision was used as both a literal and a symbolic act of making the decision to obey the law in order to seek salvation. It was a works for faith to make it to a place, right? And so... They would do this. They would have circumcision. So Paul is saying that it doesn't matter if you follow the law or not, if your faith isn't working through love. And so elsewhere, Jesus, he says that the only work that we need to do is believe in him. John chapter 6, the whole gospel of John. If you read the whole gospel of John, it all talks about love and loving one another. And so it goes back to this question that we've been asking for a while, right? Do you believe in Jesus or not? I'm not going to say what I'm thinking in my head, but it's one of those moments where you either just believe or you don't, right? Do it or don't and get over it, right? And if so, is that belief expressing itself through your love for other people? It's interesting because a lot of times when we come into church or when we're outside and doing things, we have this face that we put on, and I call it the church face. You ever have the church face? You walk in and everybody's so happy. Hey, how you doing? How is church going? Oh my goodness. You, you know, and you ask that question, right? How are you doing? And what do you say every time? I'm great. I'm so blessed. I am so happy to be here. Really? Really? It's the church face, right? I'm just so happy to be here. Here's what you do to find out how a person is feeling. Ask the question because it's an introductory question that we do as Americans, right? Or I guess in Spanish, right? Como estas? Um, how are you doing? And what will you say? I, I'm okay. And you know what you say? Do you want to sit down and talk about it? Why ask the question if you don't want to know the answer. Amen? Don't ask how I'm doing if you don't want to hear my messed up life. All right? Because I'm about to tell you that we are not all perfect. We have bad weeks. I had a busy, crazy, hectic week trying to figure out all types of different things going on. We've got Sunday school coming up. We've got all kinds of different things, Bible school and Sunday school and, and all of this stuff. I was so busy. I woke up this morning and I was so tired and I just wanted to, for somebody to say, how are you doing today? And I wanted to say, 
Let me tell you what. Brian Atwell had a week. We all have weeks, don't we? I don't have this special spiritual bubble over top of me that protects me from the world. I've got God. God will protect me, right? But we put on this face. You, you, if you were around in the early 2000s, you saw all of these shows that came about, right? Extreme whatever. Extreme home makeover edition. You remember that one? So they put this big semi over top of this house. And then they go in and they go to work and they tear this thing up. And they would go through and they would bash through walls with this sledgehammer. And they would just remodel the whole thing. And then they'd come out and they'd say what? Move the bus, right? And then they move this bus and there's this huge, immaculate, amazing house waiting for them. And then there's taxes the next day. And then there's a mortgage payment the next day. And then they have to keep up with the brand new house that they were just given the next day. No, no, no. They don't talk about anything like that, do they? No, you don't see that on TV. You see this big, immaculate, beautiful home that all of these kids and family can come in. Where are they going to get groceries? How are they going to pay the electric bill? How are you going to do all of this stuff? All you see is this big, immaculate thing right there in front of you and all this stuff waiting for you after the next day when they move the bus, right? That's a church face. Can I tell you something? Just get rid of the church face, okay? Can you do that? Just get rid of it. We're real people with real problems. We all have issues. Can I tell you that? We all have issues. We're all messed up. There are things going in our lives that we can't control, that we can't take care of. And you know how we get rid of that stuff? One another. We help each other out. And we ask the question, how are you doing? And expect the real answer. Amen? Can we do that? This is what Paul is talking about. We got to get rid of all this stuff. We got to work on love together. We got to help out our situations together. Everybody's been through problems, and we got to figure it out together. What people need is an internal change that sparks a change in our external behaviors and who we are. And how we appear on the outside or what our stuff looks on the outside doesn't matter so much as what's going on inside our hearts. So Paul continues. And he says in verse 16, scroll, move on down, scroll, I'm on my tablet. Move on down to verse 16. Paul says, so I say, walk by the Spirit. Don't walk a straight path. Don't go down the easy road. Walk by what? The Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. We're going to get into some tough stuff. Are you ready? I primed you for it. So here we go. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit. Amen. And the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. Amen. There are in con they are in conflict with each other. So you are not to do whatever you want. Oh, bummer. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Amen. Right? Because, here we go. We got the bad first. Paul always start with the bad, and then we'll go into the good, okay? The acts of the flesh are obvious. We're going to read them. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, Selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. All of this stuff he puts in, it's everything that we all deal with on a daily basis. We all struggle with some sort of sin on a daily basis. It goes through our brains. It's who we are as people. I don't care who you are. I don't care where you're from. You don't live in a bubble. You live in reality. 
And one of those things is going to hit you as a sin, right? He says a, a really good word here, though, but. But. Here's all the bad stuff. But. Here is the fruit of the Spirit. If we walk in the Spirit, we will have these things. We will be gifted these things. The fruit of the Spirit is, first and foremost, love, joy, peace. Forbearance is patience. Forbearance is patience. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Don't walk the straight path. Listen to what the Spirit is telling you to do, right? Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking and envying each other. The expression. So here, the expression of love is an example of the changed heart at work. That's what the fruit of the Spirit is. It, our spirit is being changed from the inside out. And it starts with love for one another. And so in Christ, our entire value system then begins to change. We see the sin around us. We feel and understand what's going on around us in the world today. We know what's happening. But when we have the spirit inside of us, we can see and feel it differently. You remember the conversion of Paul? Saul Paul? Tax collector? It's hard to change, isn't it? It's so hard to change. But here's Paul, the, the most evil, hated person that all Christians did not like. He got hit by the Spirit, right? He was done out for three days. Couldn't do anything. All of a sudden, the Spirit came to him. He woke up, and he was ready to go do work. Three days he was out. Three days. It's hard to change. But we can do it. Right? We can do it. The pursuit of our heart and all of our lives change. And so what we care about the most changes in our lives. And so this is the point that Paul makes in verse 16 to 26 that we just talked about. Our old way of living outside of the spirit or before we are saved is opposed when we become saved, when we become believers, it's like oil and water. All right? We live in this world of oil, and we are the water. And you cannot mix the two. And you try, and you fight, and you battle on a daily basis to try and get over all of these things. And the oil and water is going to keep pressing and pressing and pressing until Jesus comes back for us. But we must continue to battle. We must hold true to the Spirit, and we must follow it with love. Amen? We are a new creation when we believe. And God's work in new creation is all that matters. And so as Paul writes towards this conclusion of his, his letter, he says, But far be it for me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. What else can I boast for except for Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world? For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but one thing, us as a new creation. And so again, Paul uses this language of circumcision to point out that in the end, we are new in Christ. And adherence to these rules and regulations isn't the point. So here's the question that I have to ask Paul. Why? Why? Here's why. Because our old selves, who we were before we were Christians, before we received the Holy Spirit, has been crucified. It has been laid to rest. And we are a new creation, not held back by the law, because Jesus Christ has crucified us so that we might live forever in eternity. Does that make sense? We are one with him. 
our new selves are driven to live out the fruit of the Spirit. And so as we conclude today, Galatians is as radical today as when Paul wrote it because it is as much a struggle for us today as it was back then to live by faith alone. And if we aren't following the rules, how how do we know if we're doing a good job of being a Christian? On our own, we will never do a good job of being a Christian. That's why the good news of Jesus is so good. Once we recognize the bad news of our true selves, we can turn to Jesus. We can receive the good news that because of his death, we can trust in him and everything will be all right. We worry about all of these things like shortages right now. You heard the shortages of all over the place. We worry about the battles of of what's going on in the world. We worry about opposition and politics. Oh my goodness, I'm sick of politics right now. Ugh, I'm done with it. But that's the world. We have something much better to look forward to. It's heaven. It's eternity. It is life with our Savior, Jesus Christ. And let me tell you something, I am not going to let this world bring me down because it's so messed up. I am going to live higher than that. I am going to be happy about that. And I am going to enjoy time here with you all, with my family, with my friends. And I am just going to live life knowing that I have eternity with him. And that's it. Everything else is fine. It'll all be okay, right? It'll all be okay. Let's not give in to the evil of the world and seek a higher standard for how we live. Can we do that this week? Try it out. Give it a try. You will not be disappointed, all right? Disconnect from things if you have to. Get away for a while. Turn off the TV so you don't have to listen to governor such and such and whoever such and such. And and this guy fight about how this person is this way, but this person is that way. But I want to vote for you, right? Let's just get rid of it for a little while and try to just live and walk by the Spirit this week. Let's do it, all right? Let me pray for us this morning. Father, we just ask that you continue to be in our hearts, Father, to fill us with that Spirit, Father, to... Give us a strength and a hope of the things to come, Father. Father, I pray that you will continue to to utilize us to heal this land. Father, that we could be happy and joyful to love one another, Father. I ask that you can continue to teach us to serve and be a part of our community, not because we have to, Father, but because we want to, because we love to do the things like that. Father, give us a heart of courage today. Give us a heart of courage this week as we go and we seek out what it is that you want us to do in our lives. Father, thank you for this hope, for this hope of the resurrection that you will be coming back, Father, that you will take us, that we will go to eternal life with you, and and that we will not have to worry about a thing. Father, most importantly, I want to thank you for your son. I want to thank you for your son who died on the cross, Father, for our sins who gave us eternal life with you, who wiped the slate clean that we might be a new creation, a new creation for you. Father, give us grace this week. Father, give us mercy as we continue to deal with the sin of this world. I pray, Father, that you wipe all of our sin clean. It's in your most loving, compassionate name that I want to pray all of these things. Amen. Amen.